power tools going all hours of the night. I hear screaming coming from your apartment. I'm just trying to say I'm sorry. She gonna open your gift? You didn't know. back to Occult Symbolism of Pop Culture. I'm your host, Isaac Wise. Out today, we're going to talk about Jeffrey Dahmer. Particularly, we're going to talk about the Netflix show. We're going to talk about a few things. All right. The, the ideas of Aleister Crowley, Jeffrey Dahmer's interest in Satanism, and possible influence, right? And symbolism of all this stuff. Particularly from Exorcist 3, which I posit is an influence upon Jeffrey Dahmer. Entertainment has an influence, right? So, this show, let's do a little five minute preamble. The show broke Netflix streaming records, coming close to the uh, Stranger Things season four. And we've got, I watched the whole thing, right? I watched all 10 episodes. A couple months ago now, because it's taken me a while to get around to doing a little bit of study on Dahmer. Because to be honest, I didn't know a lot about the guy. You would think this would be in my wheelhouse. But I only knew the sort of main ideas of Jeffrey Dahmer, who he was, what he did. So it was actually interesting to see a lot of these things dramatized, which I thought they did a great job. It's very entertaining. And I was shocked at so many things, right? We've got, we're going to talk about statues of pizza relation, if you can read between the lines. We're going to talk about Satan. We're going to talk about the Church of Satan. We're going to talk about Aleister Crowley. We're going to talk about aliens. Well, for a second. And I will tell you my theory about how I believe Dahmer was possessed by a demon. And I will tell you which one. I'm now a demonologist. That's right. You heard it here first. I mean, the guy was doing cannibalism and a zombie manufacturing plant in his apartment. If you don't know the Dahmer story, I'm not going through the whole thing here. It took Netflix 10 hours to do that. So that's not what today's analysis will be about. So I would advise you to check it out. It's really dark, though. I got to tell you right now. So, uh, yeah, anyway, <laughs> we're going to focus on a couple themes, like I said. Oh, and then, and I don't want to gloss over this, right? Because there was a lot of drama, a lot of Dharma drama when this show released. And I guess the major complaints are that it was distasteful, which I don't know, like it happened, right? <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, Uh, it's like there's a rapper named Necro and he has this style of horrorcore. He says horrific things. And I mean, in a way, I don't know if it glorifies murder and all this stuff, but it's very dark stuff, you know. And the argument here is, is a guy like Necro, is he showcasing this stuff or is he endorsing it and the truth is i think that he is showcasing it that's what horror movies are i watch horror movies and i don't have a deviant bone in my body i don't even like killing bugs 
That's right. I saved a spider the other day. So, I mean, but the question is, does entertainment influence some people? And I would argue that maybe not only is entertainment influential on some people, but those people could be possessed by demonic spirits. But lots of people were protesting this show, uh, particularly, I believe, the African-American community because Dahmer targeted them, it seems. And, you know, some people say, oh, they're glorifying Dahmer or they're drawing up sympathy for the guy. And look, you could argue those things. I believe we are fascinated by monsters. It sucks that this happened. It's sad, but it's the truth. And we're absolutely fascinated by how horrific human beings can be. And Jeffrey Dahmer is up there with the worst of them. So I'm always anti-cancel culture. So I want to throw that bit out there. Now, the big topics we're going to cover. The first one, let's get into it. Entertainment as an influence. It's a, a debate, a discussion, an idea we've talked about for many years. And in the first episode of the Dahmer show, they show him with a victim in his apartment and he's playing The Exorcist 3 on the TV, which is kind of funny. They made a, a meme about it. I don't know if you've seen it on TikToks. You, if, you, if you've seen it, you know what I'm saying. They, they show him, he's got, the, he's got the blade and he's like pointing it to the victim. And then he's like, watch this. And he, he's supposed to be showing him Exorcist 3, but the memes, they fill in with other funny sort of things. But Exorcist 3, and, and let me go through the plot. We're going to go through Exorcist 3 real quick. I mean, this is going to be half the show, but so not real quick. But the plot of Exorcist 3 is a police lieutenant uncovers more than he bargained for as his investigation of a series of murders which have all the hallmarks of the deceased Gemini serial killer leads him to question the patience of a psychiatric ward. Now, I ironically had watched Exorcist 3, I mean, I think it was a week before I watched Dahmer, which is kind of weird. I didn't know that was going to happen. And I watched it and thought, well, gosh, this is probably the second best Exorcist film. It was really good. It's got some good jump scares. It's got some really creepy imagery. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, spoil the plot if you've never seen it, because there's a couple really good points that really make your skin crawl. But Exorcist Three is about a serial killer called the Gemini, and it's actually based on the Zodiac Killer. And the Zodiac Killer infamously, uh, apparently, liked the original Exorcist film, is what he had claimed, I guess. And in the Exorcist 3, the Gemini killer was put to death, but it had this demonic spirit and it would hop into other people. That was the idea of the show. So we're not, we're not going to do a full breakdown of the whole movie, Exorcist 3. But I will not spoil any plots, all right? So let's talk real quick about some of the ideas and themes and symbolism in Exorcist 3 because I think this plays a role in why Dahmer was obsessed with the film. First off, a fun fact about Exorcist 3, there's a cameo by Patrick Ewing, Sam Tripoli's favorite. Shout out Sam Tripoli, Tinfoil Hat Podcast. Uh, There's a cameo by Patrick Ewing and Fabio. (laughs) <laughs> See if you can catch it when you watch it. It's so out of, it's so bizarre out of left field. But the part I want to talk about is there's a doctor at the psychiatric ward of this uh, was a Georgetown Memorial Hospital, and in his office there's a lot of really dark occult symbolism. I'm going to put the images on the Instagram Instagram.com backslash Isaac Wise up link in the show notes as always like and subscribe where you can take a look at what I'm talking about. So the occult symbols in the office, you'll notice one of, he's got a bunch of images on the wall, right? And this includes one of Aleister Crowley's Scarlet Women, Layla. Scarlet Woman, so so Aleister Crowley, a very famous occultist, 
he would hook up with these women. He called them his scarlet women, and they were the ones he would use as consorts. This was, according to him, the spirit of the whore of Babylon, who would help him usher in this apocalyptic revelation to humanity. He called them Babylon also, and this was supposed to be the sexual impulse of the liberated woman. That was his idea. Mother Earth, who, who birthed and created the world. And Crowley actually believed that his women, his scarlet women, were the avatars of the Whore of Babylon. And they were going to manifest the New Age, the Aeon of Horus, as he put it. So there's a very famous picture of Layla, uh, Layla Waddell, who's one of his scarlet women. And she's doing the, this pose with her, hand, her fingers crossed and her thumbs straight up at perpendicular angle to her hand. This is the horns of Pan pose, similar to what Crowley would do with his thumbs, right? He would put his thumbs at a 90 degree angle with the fist and put them up to the side of his head, his horns. And it's a very famous photo, and it's in Exorcist 3, in the doctor's office. And you're like, what's that about, right? Well, Layla was actually Crowley's most powerful muse. They would eventually break up because, you know, Crowley was cheating on her because he was doing what thou wilt. But you see her in the office. You can also see an image referred to as the Ancient of Days. And the Ancient of Days is a reference to God from the book of Daniel. And what's interesting, and I believe William Blake did a derivation of it, but what's interesting is on the bottom of the image, you're going to see in a circle this inverted arched body of a human. We're going to come back to that. We're going to discuss that in depth because it ties into the pizza emails, it ties into Podesta, and it ties into Dahmer's death ceremony, right? Also, there is an image I caught of, he's got a stack of newspapers in his office. One of the headlines talks about the Joker. I mean, kind of of interest. Joker is the agent of nihilism, the agent of chaos in the comic series. And if we go back to Crowley, Crowley was saying that the Scarlet Woman is the female consort to the male genitor, generative force of chaos. And here we see the Joker, the agent of chaos, also the archetype of the trickster or the devil. Another interesting catch, there is a framed photo of the doctor of himself on the wall, and he has his arms crossed in an X. Kind of like they do in uh, Black Panther and Wakanda. They cross their arms. Well, this is symbolic of the ancient mystery Babylon religion of the worship of the sun god Osiris. Now, Osiris is part of the alleged Freemasonic Luciferian solar religion. Osiris represents the sun, the shining light. And it also represents the evolution of man into the new Luciferian age. Now, here's what's interesting, though. Because in the film, you will see during... Um, there's an interrogation of... Oh boy. Okay, so the detective who's like researching, he's like the protagonist in the film. He's researching this whole thing, trying to make sense of what's going on with the Gemini killer. And he's in this madman's cell. And the killer tells him that he's a traveling man. Now, that's all the context they give you. But we all know, because we follow this stuff, to say you're a traveling man is to identify as a Freemason. That's the term they use. So here we have, in Exorcist 3, him talking about being a Freemason through this coded language. Then the doctor in the office has an image of him with his arms crossed, which is a reference to Osiris, which is allegedly part of the Freemasonic solar religion of Luciferianism. Now, why you may ask, why, why cross the arms? Well, because X represents Osiris. Osiris risen, you know? That's why the ancients, 
the Egyptians would bury their pharaohs in the sarcophagus with their arms crossed. And I believe the Knights Templar were buried with their arms and legs crossed. And then there's this infamous image of Aleister Crowley dressed up in Egyptian garb with his arms crossed. And this all relates to the skull and bones with the crossbones. And this goes into a whole bunch of stuff. I think I did a show on 322 was the title in the last year, maybe two. Talking about March 22nd. We tied it into the Knights Templar and all this stuff. Now, fun fact, NASA has a mission in process right now to bring back a sample from an asteroid to see if there is life in outer space. That mission is called the OSIRIS-REx. Now, granted, it's not OSIRIS-X, but it's very close. And we all know NASA has a lot of strange symbolism You know, Buzz was doing that Freemasonic ritual, headed out to the moon, took that Freemasonic apron out there with him. And also in this image in Exorcist 3, you'll see the hanged man from the tarot card right next to the image of the doctor with his arms crossed. What is going on at Georgetown Memorial Hospital? What is happening there? It's Illuminate confirmed, my goodness. And the doctor's wearing a ring. I couldn't get a good tell of what it was. I didn't have the uh, ultra high def version going, so I couldn't tell. Might be a, a skull ring, like your boy Johnny Depp wears. Johnny Depp's got all that symbolism of the Osiris with his arms crossed too. And should you have doubts that Exorcist Three has occult symbolism throughout of Aleister Crowley and the mystery religion of the secret societies, in the final chase, in the film, the police car they use. Car number 77. That's right. I'm going to put the image on the Instagram. See it for yourself, folks. Again, more Crowley symbolism because Crowley wrote a book called Liber Oz, which means book 77. Liber Oz is only one page. It's called a book, but it's only one page. It's basically Crowley's Declaration of Independence. It's his vision for mankind. It's the new rites according to this new religion of Thelema. It's the way of the new age, the Aeon of Horus. Okay? Hence all the talk about the consort, the scarlet woman, all of this is to usher in the new age. An age with an emphasis on man and not priests and gods and organized religion. A satanic religion, maybe. Probably. Definitely. And if you want to dig into it, which I know you do, in Liber ABA, Book 4, Magic, it says... This brief paper, first published in 1941, first appears in typescript in an intermediate form of an OTO degree ritual worked in Australia, believed to date from 1916 and revised in 1919. In his correspondence with G.J. York, Crowley describes it as the OTO plain, I'm sorry, the OTO plan in words of one syllable. So he's saying it's the OTO plan. Now, Thelema, Crowley's religion, was supposedly supposed to be the whole crux of the OTO, the magical order. I'm oversimplifying that, but that's how I understand it. On September 13th, he added, quote, Rights of man is an historical document. The items don't go easily on the tree of life, but I've got them down to five sections. Moral, bodily, mental, sexual freedom, and the safeguard tyrannicide. 160 words in all. So that's what Crowley was talking about. Like I said, his declaration of independence, right, for his new religion. Now, fun fact, Layla, that scarlet woman we see on the wall, is from Australia, Layla Waddell. She's from Australia, which is apparently where this Lieber Oz book was written, where it came from. And what's really weird is that there is a book in that doctor's office in Exorcist 3, there's several books, right? So it got a bookshelves. But one of them says it's about Easter Island. Well, Layla, Layla Waddell, was believed to be of Maori bloodlines. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. That right. Maori, Maori bloodlines, which is apparently indigenous Polynesians of New Zealand, which apparently included the same Polynesians who settled Easter Island. Hey, 
Might be a stretch there, folks, but it connects. But let's look to the Libra Oz. What does it say? What does this declaration say? Well, it says a bunch of stuff. It says, the law of the strong. This is our law and the joy of the world. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. Thou hast no right but to do thy will. Do that and no other shall say nay. Now let's pause for a second. When he says do what thou wilt, he's saying that you need to make contact with your guardian angel, this entity. And that entity will relay to you your purpose for being in existence. And you should stop at absolutely nothing to do that, that whatever that purpose is. And Crowley himself talked to the spirit of Awaz, which he later identified as the devil. And that's the, that was his guardian angel who told him what he was supposed to do. So it's like, I'm supposed to listen to the demons to tell me what to do? What you talking about, bro? Let's keep let's keep reading. Every man and every woman is a star, which of course is the the, the age we're in, right? Crowley was a hundred years ahead of his time. He knew that the new religion was going to be the religion of man worshiping himself, man as star, which is social media. Everyone's a celebrity. Everything's got to be documented for the world to see. No one can just be peaceful in their home, talking to their family or whatever. We got to. I don't know, broadcast everything we do now, right? He says there will be no emphasis on external gods or priests. It will only be self-centered. Doing your own will, which is the antithesis to Christianity to do God's will. So if you want to say it's the inversion of Christianity, that's accurate. If you want to say it's satanic, I would argue that's accurate too. Just not such a straight line between the two. Let's keep reading. It says, there is no God but man. All right, we just talked about that. Man has the right to live by his own law, to live in the way that he wills to do, to work as he will, to play as he will, to rest as he will, to die when and how he will. Man has the right to eat what he will, drink, dwell, move around, blah, 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 to think, to speak, to write, to draw, to paint, to cave, to build, to dress. Man has the right to love as he will. Take your fill and... And will of love as ye will, when, where, and with whom ye will. All right, you kind of get that. Man has the right to kill those who would thwart these rights. This is social Darwinianism, which is the philosophy behind the Church of Satan. Man has the right to kill those who would thwart those rights. So he's saying, talk to your demon guardian angel. Let it fill your head with what you should do, your self-centered will, man's flawed logic and flawed will, and you should pursue it. And if anyone gets in your way, you kill them. Nonsense, right? And then he says, the slaves shall serve. And to me, that's the most telling statement of the whole thing. I think this is what the Illuminati, global elitist, these rich jerks, I think that's what they all believe in. They look at us, they look at humanity as slaves, and we need to serve them for their will. They believe in this prosperity gospel nonsense of, oh, yeah, God made you rich because you're the chosen one. And, you know, do what, you're, do what you will with all your money and make sure you, uh, you know, keep the sheeple where they need to be. The slaves shall serve. It's a very capitalistic, social Darwinian idea. And and you could go into a whole argument on whether or not America and capitalism, free market capitalism, is it more satanic or more Christian? I mean, you probably know where I stand on that. I say it's more satanic than anything. But the truth is, it's a pretty great system. I don't know if there's a better system. Communism isn't better. Fascism isn't better. So I'm not complaining. I just want to raise awareness of it. Because I feel like if you're aware of it, then maybe you can make it do better, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So the stuff that Aleister Crowley is talking about is all satanic in the aspect that it's always about the self over anything. Which is why Crowley couldn't keep a relationship. He had like, I don't know, eight women and they all went nuts. They turned into alcoholics and were in insane asylums and all that. 
Anyway, back to Dahmer. Okay, we made it through Exorcist 3. You see there's a lot to unpack there in the film Exorcist 3. So it's interesting that Dahmer was obsessed with this and insisted on showing it to the people in his apartment, his victims. Excuse me, I'm still getting over the big you-know-what. The thing from 2020 that'll never go away. It's apparently never going to go away for me. I don't know. It's been four weeks. Okay. Um, in episode one, let's talk about these Polaroids, right? There's these Polaroids that the that are in the nightstand. Dahmer's taking Polaroids as victims. He's making his own art, just like Crowley said in Libra Oz. Man should make his own art, right? But there's Polaroids in there, and there's a scene... In episode one that we need to talk about a particular Polaroid uh, and I, I I hesitate to put this on the Instagram you can look it up the I the, the image that you'll see is Dahmer had a person with their head removed he cut their head off and put them in a position where they were arched their stomach was arched it's a very strange hard to describe but it's a very specific pose it's very hard to get into I, I believe in yoga it would be called a a boat pose i don't know i could be no i don't think it's a boat pose it doesn't matter very strange positioning the person is arched with their hips towards the sky all right now what's interesting about that positioning is we have to go back to 2016 with the Emails released on WikiLeaks about pizza stuff, right? You might, you know what I'm talking about? Don't make me say it. Don't let me say it out loud. Well, some of those emails were relating to John and Tony Podesta. Tony Podesta has a statue in his home. It's one of six in the world of this headless corpse in the same position. Of course, it's bronze, right? It's not gory or nothing, but it's a headless person in the same pose i mean what are the odds right the same arched pose and defenders of all this crap will say well you know this is actually based on a 1993 piece of art from Louis bourgeau called arch of hysteria and from what i read and this is this gets a little dicey as we go it could be a little off on this bourgeau claims it was inspired by this 19th century sketch of a guy who had a head doing a similar pose, but it doesn't even look the same. I, I looked at it, I'm like, it doesn't even look the same, but I guess that's why it's inspired, right? And apparently it was a reference to women being quote-unquote hysterical, like being mad. That's why it's called the Arch of Hysteria. It was a, a commentary on feminism or something like that. But what's interesting is uh, some people really got into this, as you know, back in 2016 and if you scour the depths of the internet you'll see people put together a lot of good arguments and different images and ideas and one of them shows that same artist Louis Bourgeau had these other sculptures and Louise who I believe is a female the sketches the, the these these sculptures are in Toronto but the sketches the, the statues were based on had what appeared to be a child with a, um, you know, what what Dave Chappelle had, brown snake turned into brown stick. You know what I'm saying? But the sculptures doesn't have the brown stick, <laughs> right? So kind of creepy, right? Kind of creepy. And everyone also notes like, hey, that art was created two years after Dahmer was arrested. Those images were known by the public at this point. And the positioning is almost identical. It's it's slightly off. The arm positioning is a little off, but I mean, close enough, right? It's very bizarre. And if you want to get into the full theory of it, it goes so deep into this. You'd have to snoop around. But Tony Podesta, who was John Podesta's brother, was hanging out with Dennis Haster, who was the Republican Speaker of the House. He was the longest running Speaker of the House in Republican history. Hastert infamously got in trouble for sexually abusing underage boys. And then, you know, John Podesta, old Skippy, he's got quite the rap sheet. He was uh, he was the campaign manager for Democratic 
presidential candidate Hillary Clinton. He is tied into the ancient alien stuff. He is affiliated on some level with that To the Stars Academy stuff with Tom DeLonge, Peter Lavenda, who's definitely smart on the occult. Uh, I don't know what's going on there. There's something going on there. I don't know what it is. All right, don't go storming the Capitol. I don't know what it is. I'm just saying. It does get messy. And it, and once you start clicking around, which I'd advise to get a VPN if you're going to do it, uh, a lot of the web links have been removed, and, I mean, it gets dark quick. So there there's that. <laughs> <laughs> There's that. So Dahmer had this Polaroid, and it ties into the whole pizza email thing. And some people believe it's part of a more insidious thing. Like maybe Dahmer was part of some inner group of people that did this stuff. I don't know. Oh, yeah, real briefly, before we get into the big topic, the mom, what was her deal? In episode three, you heard that she saw a UFO. Did you catch that? I looked up on Reddit. I found this. Some Someone commented, no sources. I don't know if this is true. They wrote, yes, it's true. According to the local paper, Joyce chased the UFO in her car and then went home and got Lionel, David, and Jeff and continued the pursuit. Police and others saw it. The UFO later landed in someone's yard and was revealed to be a bag with candles underneath like an amateur hot air balloon thing. I don't know if Lionel was as angry and insulting about it as they portray in the show. Presumably, he was just as curious since he joined her in the car. So, I, I don't know. Maybe she saw a UFO. A real one. Maybe they were visited by an alien. Maybe a demonic spirit from another dimension came through. And then the mother, there was a whole storyline about the mother taking pills and, uh, you know, that ties into Big Pharma and all that stuff. But the big topic, the one I want to focus in on is the question, was Jeffrey Dahmer into Satanism? And I, let's just go into it first. In episode one, you'll see the Satanic Bible in his room, which I was kind of shocked by. I was like, is that real? And I looked around online. There wasn't any clear proof of this, just a bunch of dummies talking about it. So I bought this book, The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer by Brian Masters. And this is what it says. There were other things he was doing secretly, which grandma might have deemed not a good idea. He had secured a copy of Anton LaVey's Satanic Bible, which he poured over in his room while she said her prayers to a more benign God. Even more peculiar was an experiment he conducted at work. Taking so much blood from people in the course of his job, he found himself wondering what it might taste like and what effect it might have upon him. He concealed a vial of blood in his pocket and took it to the roof of the plasma center where he proceeded to drink it. Okay. We're going to go through some more, some more tidbits, then we're going to wrap it up. So that's very strange, right? He really did have, uh, you know, the satanic Bible. Now, I have one, too. It's on my hard drive. So, does that make me illuminate confirmed? No, I'm just reading it for research purposes. In episode five, we find out Dahmer has an altar, which I found very interesting. And in episode 10, he confesses to the priest that he was making an altar for the devil from human body parts. Now, I wanted to learn more about this. I was like, whoa, 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 back up. What are we talking about here? And the show doesn't go into it. But if you watch The Conversation with a Killer, the Jeffrey Dahmer tape show, also on Netflix, on episode two at the beginning, they say that he wanted to play the devil. And that's why he was watching Exorcist 3. So he seemed to be very much interested in it, right? He then had what I'd refer to as almost a religious conversion in reverse. He began to think, well, maybe there's a devil and maybe it's my destiny to carry out the work of the devil. He began engaging in all kinds of bizarre incantations. He began relating to parts of movies that seemed to suggest that there were evil forces out there. Return of the Jedi was one of them. He really identified with the Emperor. He wanted like that mind control. 
He had those, you know, yellow eyes. So Jeff actually found some place where he could get contacts that were yellow eyes. And so before he would go out at night, he would put the contacts in. He had to get himself charged up by trying to emulate a devil or evil person to fulfill his fantasies. People go to these gory horror movies to to get a glimpse at, uh, at what they show in the movies. The only difference is I did it for real. I got more on the altar here. Then, uh, sorry, I'm trying to read my notes here. Oh, and then in episode eight of the Dahmer show, his father said Dahmer was possessed by a demon. All right. There's just little tidbits. But to go into the conversation with the killer Jeffrey Dahmer tapes show, if you go to episode three, they actually will show you the proposed altar, which doesn't necessarily line up with exactly how it's described. Um, let's see here. If I go to the book, The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer, it says this. Blah, blah, blah. To match this development, in the summer of 1988, he bought a long black table and two statues of griffins. He still nurtured the idea of his own temple, and these were steps towards its realization. The black table would be the altar, and the griffins, mythological creatures with the head and wings of an eagle and the body of a lion would be its protection. So that's a pretty good uh, description of what it's going to look like. And if you dig around, you'll see that he was talking about, he tried a bunch of stuff to try to preserve these bodies. He was going to buy a big, uh, like a, what do you call it? Like a, uh, uh, like a freeze dry machine, but he couldn't get one big enough to put a whole body in. And ugh. he was keeping all these body parts throughout the apartment. But then there's a couple other religious elements to consider. Like in episode four, he says he's an atheist, and they talk about how his dad was a scientist. And if you look at the big scheme of things, a lot of theorists claim that they want us to go from Christianity to atheism or science, the religion of science. But man's a spiritual creature, and we will create a new religion, and that will be the religion of the Antichrist. That's the theory. The Luciferian religion of the Freemasons. Allegedly. Also, the priest in... I believe this is in the conversation tapes. Yeah, the conversation tape show. The priest said that the day Jeffrey Dahmer got baptized in the prison, because if you watch the show, you'll find out he gets baptized to Christ, was the same day that John Wayne Gacy was executed and the same day there was a solar eclipse. So it seems the stars were aligning for something very strange that day. Uh, so let's wrap it all up because I got a few. I got a lot more to talk about, but let's let's do a little in conclusion and sort of put all the pieces together. What was Jeffrey Dahmer trying to do in this book, The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer? He suggests something that's kind of wild. He suggests that Dahmer was maybe unwillingly even trying to get in touch with a more ancient pagan religion. Referring to the incident where he drank the blood at the plasma center. <clears throat> and if you read my book, The Dark Path, you'll know that Blavatsky talked about the religion of the past is the religion of the future. So let's read from the book. It says... These were the first stirrings of an interest in what Dahmer mistakenly referred to as Satanism. It was to develop progressively over the years and work towards a startling denouement. It was a personal quest, a, dif a diffuse and stumbling attempt to establish contact with those turbulent, dark, and unanswerable exigencies of primitive nature, recognized by the pagans before civilization tamed them by denying them. But they are never entirely denied, and they display themselves in disguise throughout history. From the predate history and in no, I'm sorry. For they predate history and infuse the acts and thoughts of men with involuntary notions they barely apprehend. Art and law and society seek to keep them under control, 
Religions unwittingly perpetuate their power. The essence of these elemental forces is their necessity and irresistibility. They are not contingent, but constant and immutable. They cannot change or be fought against, for they represent the endless cycle of the earth and its doings. Its infinite progression and regression, surge and swell, movement towards no other end than self-regeneration. I do not suggest that Dahmer made any intellectual inquiry into such matters, but that he, unknowingly, was fumbling for an understanding of them, since he could not perceive himself within the accepted norms, categories, and assimilations of civilization. Perhaps he might find some glimmer of recognition and explanation in the chaos of primitive night. He was searching for his daemons, that is, his personal guardians, through the unlit world of urge and response, the tight spirals he had drawn as a child were summoned to the remorseless swirling and blah, blah, blah. This guy's getting real flowery, right? But you talking about the holy guardian angel there, his daemons, his personal guardians, talking about pursuing his will, talking about uh, how he doesn't fit into society and how society tries to suppress these these animalistic urges of man, which is what Crowley's Aeon of Horus is about unleashing. It's all about embracing that satanic wild side. Let me keep reading here. The wish to look upon Satan was a demand for identity, the hope that a mirror might be thrust before him. The drinking of blood was an unconscious initiation into the world of the earth and its deep pre-human spirituality. He did not like it. He spat it out. It was not his way, but he would find other ways in the future and gradually grope towards an expression of coupling with the underworld, which was all his own. So, was he possessed? My throat's falling apart here, folks. I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying. I got to wrap it up. Was he possessed? Did he take possession? Was it a demon? And if it was, I would argue it is this particular one. I've talked about it before. There is a story about a guy named Gilda Ray. And Gilda Ray was a knight. He was a lord in the French army. He was friends with Joan of Arc, who also channeled spirits. And in 1432, he was accused of killing hundreds of children in occult rituals. He would then be condemned to death. Because his friends would confess that they knew that Gilda Ray was doing these crimes. And the trials revealed how he was sodomizing kids before he would kill them. He would wine and dine the kids, strip them naked, hang them with ropes. While he would pleasure himself onto this poor child. He would, uh, after he would do his thing on the kid, he would take them down from the ropes. He would decapitate them, dismember them, slicing the throats, breaking the necks. Um, sometimes he would do all that. Then he would um, pleasure himself onto the corpse. And one of the servants of his said this, he said, when the, chil when the said children were dead, he kissed them. And those who had the most handsome limbs and heads, he held up to admire them and had their bodies cruelly cut open and took delight at the sight of their inner organs. Very often when the children were dying, he sat on their stomachs and took pleasure in seeing them die and laughed. Doesn't that sound like the sickness of Jeffrey Dahmer? Now, Gilda Ray, and this is where you might be shocked if you didn't hear me talk about this in the past. Alistair Crowley said that Gilda Ray was the male equivalent of Joan of Arc. And the only crime he ever did was the pursuit of knowledge. Because again, if you get into this stuff, these wackos think they could just do whatever they want. The slaves shall serve, remember? They should be allowed to do whatever they want. They're chosen to do the do the nasty stuff they want to do. Then, again, and we're putting a bow on all this. We talked about Freemasonry a lot. In 1992, a Freemason Grandmaster of the Grand Lodge of France retried this Gilda Ray case from 500 years before and found him not guilty. Why would they do that? And they claimed, like, oh, he was a victim of false charges. A lot of historians say, no, homeboy did this stuff. And if you dig into it, the original trial of 1438 showed that Gilda Ray 
was seeking enlightenment through alchemy and summoning demons. And the, the he tried to summon this demon, spelled B-A-R-O-N. I don't want to say it. Uh, sometimes I say it, sometimes I don't. I'm trying to be more careful about it. B-A-R-R-O-N is the name of the demon he was trying to summon. And the demon signed a contract with Gilda Ray. And the demon's like, I want all these body parts of these kids. So that's what I would argue. If you wanted me to give a theory about who Jeffrey Dahmer was possessed by, that's the one. So do I think Dahmer was possessed by this this demon? I mean, there's there's a very strange darkness behind this. There's this weird blending of sexuality and death. Uh, and I'm going to refer to you to my final argument here. Going back to the same book, The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer. Talking about this victim of his named Cash D. Cash D was the first with whom Dahmer could experiment on the newly acquired black table. That's that altar, right? He placed the corpse on the table in various positions, which he found attractive, always posing it to look good. I rushed out the next day to buy a Polaroid camera at Black's Photo on 125 West Wisconsin Avenue. He was in a way virtually creating his own pornography, as if the picture of beauty was more alluring than beauty itself. This is tantamount to saying that fantasy, solid, sculpted, manageable, and unthreatening, has finally become more deeply important than reality. It is also more stimulating, whereas Dahmer had found it impossible to reach orgasm with the partners he met at the Unicorn Bathhouse in Chicago. He was able to stand over the dead body of Cash D and masturbate to ejaculation. Which is almost the same identical process as Gilda Ray's weird ass with the demon he was possessed by. And then, uh, final thought here, final thought here. Even if it wasn't this theory of mine about the, that particular demon, there was something surely evil going on. And in this book, The Shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer, they go into this possession idea using Dahmer's own words. All right. Coming from a religious family and having spent two years wrestling with the evil that he saw within him, it was natural that Dahmer's understanding of his dilemma should express itself in terms of diabolic possession. The devil is seen as the agent of the imbalance or disorder, the creator of chaos and moral anarchy. Kind of like the Joker we talked about er earlier. Quote, am I just an extremely evil person or is it some sort of satanic influence or what, he wondered. I have no idea. I have no idea at all. Do you? Is it possible to be influenced by spirit beings? I know that sounds like an easy way to cop out and say I couldn't help myself, but from all that the Bible says, there are forces that have a direct or indirect influence on people's behavior. From this moment, Dahmer began to welcome the intrusive thoughts, no matter where they came from. Quote, The Bible calls him Satan. I suppose it's possible because it sure seems like some of the thoughts aren't my own. They just come blasting into my head. They go stronger and more urgent and steadily gain momentum. It was as if his life has been guided or being guided by malignancy. Oh, sorry. That's not part of the quote. It ends at they just come blasting into my head. Then it continues. These thoughts are very powerful, very destructive, and they do not leave. They're not the kind of thoughts... You can just shake your head and they're gone. They do not leave. That was Dahmer's own words. So, and if you, and if you, if you look into that book, the shrine of Jeffrey Dahmer, it talks about how cannibalism goes into some weird spiritual territory. Maybe even this ancient history of man, this ancient pagan religion stuff. He makes an interesting comparison trying to say there's this archetypal, uh, what did what did uh, Carl Jung call it? Archaic remnants. That's what he called. It. Or is that Freud? Anyway, archaic remnants. This archetypal memory that we all seem to have of cannibalism, like how parents when they play with their kids, when they're little tiny kids, they'll act like they're eating them. They go, rah, 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 gobble you up, whatever, right? Like, why do we do that? We don't mean we're really going to do it. Like we're screwing around, right? We're just playing. And then he says, it goes further. If you go into the, uh, as adults, when you're in the bedroom, this idea of oral sex and even the terms we use for that. 
He suggests maybe there's this primal urge there in our history, and it's subdued, and we've evolved out of it. All of us except for Dahmer, who made contact with this thing. Or maybe even the Illuminati does it, right? We talked about this many times. Uh, there's a new movie by Luca Guadagnino called Bones and All. I haven't seen it yet. It's about cannibalism. Lots of cannibalism shows. If you listen to... Uh, I did a really good show about Kurth Barker. Uh, same time I did a film analysis for the film Fresh. We talked about these topics as it relates to the Illuminati. I'll put links in the show notes. Uh, but yeah, this is a topic that comes up often. So there you go. That's my best two cents about Dahmer and the influences of Dahmer. The demons that probably possessed him. Uh, it's an interesting subject. It's dark. It's really dark. So my call to action for you if you have a friend or family member who watch those Dahmer shows send them this episode have them take a listen see what they think because it's a very interesting show and I think it scratched the surface of a darker more insidious truth alright thanks for listening thanks for your time till next time stay woke